So gently bring your awareness back into your setting. Just become aware of your surroundings, feeling anchored in your body temple. You may want to wiggle your toes, wiggle your fingers, shrug your shoulders, just to bring that awareness back into the body temple. And as you feel ready, open your eyes. So welcome to any of you who joined us during the meditation. We're so glad you're with us this evening on Facebook Live or Zoom. We will begin our service, as always, with our opening chant, led by our wonderful Tina Meeks and Sam Krieger. song one day. God is in this place. Oh, yes, indeed. Thank you, Tina and Sam. So let's join in consciousness to know that truth at a deeper level. As we close our eyes, turn our attention inward, and really allow the truth of those words, God is in this place, to sink in because Truly, there is God and only God that is the only power, the only life, the infinite love, infinite intelligence, infinite creativity out of which all creation comes into being and its nature lies at the center of everything and everyone, including each of us gathered for this virtual service this evening. I know that God is absolutely present as a vibration of love that we feel calling us to know and experience its nature, greater goodness, beyond ways that we have experienced it. It is that calling of love that brings us together, and we feel that vibration of love in that sense of connectedness that we can feel, even when we're not physically in the same place. I know it is that love that inspires each and every one of those individuals who are of service this evening. And I absolutely know that God is flowing through our music ministry, through Sam and Tina. And I open myself to being that channel through which the word that is to be spoken this evening is spoken, that it is a message that all of us, myself included, have come to awaken to, to hear, to embrace. And so I know that every part of this service supports that greater knowingness of the divine within us. And so I give thanks 
right here, right now, for all the blessings we receive in this time. And in gratitude, I release this word, knowing it's already done in the mind of God. And so it is. Amen. And so now, please join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Wonderful. Yes, indeed. Showered with love. That feels good. I like that. <laughs> so, this evening I want to look, in keeping with the theme of showering people with love, um, also doing no harm. You know, the talk title is Do No Harm. And I think that's a pretty good ideal for all of us to live by. I think situations out there in the world might look a lot better if that was in the forefront of everyone's consciousness to try as much as we can to do no harm to others. And it's certainly a principle, an idea that reverberates through every major world religion. I know we've, many of us have heard it as the golden rule of treating others as we would like to be treated, that actually originates, I know most people uh, hear it from the teachings of Jesus, but he as a rabbi was teaching a principle from the Torah, from the book of Leviticus. And uh, so it's something that flows through Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and all the Eastern traditions, like science of mind, emphasize this idea that on the unseen side of life, we're all interconnected, that we're not nearly as separate as we perceive ourselves to be. And we emphasize the, in our teaching, as well as in the Eastern philosophies, that there's a law of cause and effect that ensures that we really can't impose suffering on another because as we're all interconnected, we impose suffering on another it's somehow going to come back to us and cause suffering for ourselves. And we want to be clear that the suffering isn't imposed by a God outside of us, because we do not believe God resides outside of us. We believe God lies within everything and everyone. Uh, so it's not that God is punishing us per se, but this is a consequence from us straying from our divine nature of love and the suffering that we incur causes us to go deeper to understand what it is that we're doing that's causing the suffering and eventually awaken to the fact that doing harm to someone else, we're doing harm to ourselves as well. Because if you get to the core of the science of mind teaching that we're all imbued with God's nature and that we're all on a journey of awakening to that nature, the more we perceive, the more we believe and sense that that nature of God lies within us all the time, lies at the center of everything, then we experience more of that nature. We're more open to the ways that we can call it forth. We're more open to when we see others not acting in accordance with that nature, to know that, okay, they've just strayed from center, from their core nature, but that potential lies within them, and to focus on that to see how can we change this, how can we bring forth that greater potential that is there to be believed or to be experienced, pardon me. So when we inflict harm on others, either intentionally or unintentionally, from not being spiritually awake enough to see that our actions are hurtful, we're not experiencing and expressing our divine nature 
to the degree that we can. So the idea of not harming others is not just, this is what you should do to be a good person and to be lovable. It's really for our benefit. It's for us to have a greater experience of God's nature within us. And don't imagine that there's anyone tuned into this or here in the sanctuary that would argue that this idea of do no harm is a good ideal to live by. I think we can all go along with that. But here's where this gets tricky. Have you ever done something that in no way was intended to inflict harm on others? And in actual fact, really, in and of itself, was not doing anything to anyone else, but they took offense, they got hurt, they got wounded. You know, you chose a direction, a career path in life that family or loved ones didn't agree with, but it was your calling. But now they are upset and hurt. You were chosen for a job that someone else wanted, and so now they feel wounded when you accepted it. You were asked to do something that you didn't really feel was appropriate for you to do. And now, you know, someone is hurt by the fact that you said no. Someone fell in love with you and you didn't feel the same way. And now they're hurt. I remember an interracial couple years back being interviewed saying how both their families kept harping on how can you say that you're not hurting anyone because they were so upset by this interracial marriage. You know, it wasn't within their value system. They weren't doing anything to hurt anyone and yet others were feeling harmed or hurt, injured as a result of their actions. I, I bet there are any number of examples that we could think of where we felt wounded by others when in truth, when we really examined what was going on, they weren't doing anything to us. Maybe we just had expectations and decided that's what they should have done and they didn't follow our plan. And so we felt hurt by that. And let's face it, Others probably have felt slighted, hurt, even betrayed by us, by our actions, when in fact that just really wasn't what was going on. And where I say this whole thing of do no harm gets tricky is because if we give in to that, we can our, allow ourselves to be restricted or inhibited from our fullest expression of life and our fullest expression of love based on the fact that we're concerned that others might not like what we're doing, what we feel called to do. They might not approve. They might feel hurt. And to this, I bring the quote that Gandhi reminded us. He said, nobody can hurt me without my permission. No one can really hurt us without our permission, meaning that our divine essence, that God nature within us, can never be tarnished, can never be damaged, can never be hurt by anything that happens to us humanly. It transcends the world of conditions. And the more we identify with our divine nature and not our human experiences or conditions, the less we're affected by worldly conditions or actions, even those that were intended to hurt us. Yes, people can harm us humanly. There's no question about that. And this isn't about being a doormat. Gandhi was not a doormat, if you know the story of his life. He stood up for his principles. Um, you know, a lot of people were very annoyed <laughs> with him, you know, standing by his principles, and eventually uh, leading to India, freeing themselves of the British rule. But 
He did it in a way that never, ever disrespected others. And, you know, he was clear that he could be hurt physically, but not spiritually. And that's what he asked his followers to remember. So I think when we can go with that attitude, it's not, like I said, about being a doormat, but it's more about the fact that when we're not allowing ourselves to feel wounded, when we really feel that divine nature that's greater than anything anyone is doing to us, it prevents us from getting all tangled up in those patterns of resentment, hurt, anger, unforgiveness, those things that just weigh us down, that don't allow us to experience love and joy and the lightness of being, just being in the world and expressing our divine nature. And so that's why we keep doing our work in consciousness to know that God in us is greater than any human experience we encounter. And there are times when we need to accept that others may feel hurt, harmed, injured, or have taken offense to something that we've done, but they're really, when we're clear, there really was nothing that we were doing that was harming them. We can also know that God in them is bigger than their sense of woundedness, than whatever it is that's causing them to take offense. Because actually, when we give in to that part of them and say, oh, no, I just don't want them to be hurt, when in fact we're not doing something that's intended to hurt them, we're playing to their smaller selves, to their ego selves, and denying in ourselves the fact that there's a bigger presence of God in them. And so, in a sense, it, this is their opportunity to get beyond some of their patterns of codependency for us to be a certain way or do certain things in order for them to be happy. So, that said, this doesn't give us carte blanche to just go out and say, well, no one can really be hurt by anything I do unless they allow themselves to be and just, you know, do whatever we want without considering how our actions might be harmful. I think the steps we take are, first, I know we all know, deep down, when we intentionally feel the need to hurt someone because we've been hurt. We know that that's what's going on, right? When we're going to, um, you know, try to retaliate in some way because we're upset by their actions. It might make us feel better for a moment, but I think we all know this is never productive in the long run. We're coming from a place of woundedness that denies our divine nature, and that, that doesn't lift us up. So in those situations when we're feeling like we need to retaliate in some way, take revenge, do our work to remember God in me is greater than my hurt. Admit that that's what I'm feeling right now. I'm feeling hurt, but God in me is greater than that. There's nothing I need to change in that person to experience my divine nature. That's empowering. Far more empowering than anything we could do to anyone else. The second, I think, thing is for us to be open to the fact that we may not always be aware of how our actions are humanly harmful to others. You know, in this uh, practical mysticism class I'm teaching, one of the subjects that comes up, uh, came up in uh, our reading this week was the importance of humility. And when we're humble, we're open to the fact that, you know, we're not perfect, we are not fully evolved, and it's easier to admit to what we've done that may have harmed someone when we realize that that's what happened, and then be willing to make changes based on that new awareness. When we're coming from that, that place, 
that we can say, okay, now I see I've done something wrong or I've done something hurtful and I can change. I can, my divine potential allows me to move in a different direction. That's really all the divine asks of us. As Jesus told the adulteress, go and sin no more. That's all we're asked to do. When we realize the error of our ways, we just are asked to awaken to the truth of who we are as divine beings and uh, move into different patterns of behavior. And I think often our fear of being judged by others, if we admit to our errors, you know, what are they going to think of me? Um, you know, they're not going to respect me anymore. Those kinds of ideas hold us back from admitting to our errors and addressing them constructively. Or the other thing we tend to do is we keep berating ourselves for the errors. That's not productive. There's no point in reminding yourself of how you messed up if it doesn't teach you something so you can move forward and act in different ways. So we admit to the error, to the mistake, but we don't let it define us. It's about calling forth compassion for ourselves, for ourselves and for others. And, you know, knowing that we're continually evolving spiritually, we can accept that we're not always going to show up at our best. There are going to be some ways that we just haven't awakened yet. And, you know, along the way, we're all prone to do things that negatively impact others. When we understand that, we can have more compassion for others when they're not showing up at their best and for ourselves when we're not showing up at our best. And again, it's about reminding ourselves that God in us is greater than our transgressions and we can call it forth to make good of our errors and also reminding ourselves that God in us is bigger than our woundedness. So I say as we go forward, let's remember that God in us is greater than our hurts so we can allow those to heal and move forward and that God in us is greater than any of our actions that may hurt others. In working from these two angles, reminding ourselves of these truths, we remain aligned with that vibration of God's goodness, that God, of God's love that extricates us from our hurts and shows us the way to make good when we've wounded others. So I invite you to just take a moment to turn your attention inward and call to mind any feeling of being harmed, hurt, wounded by others' actions. Just allow yourself to call that forth. And then bring your awareness to the fact that despite that, you're still able to love. You're still able to laugh and feel joy. You're still able to be creative. God's nature in you remains untouched by this experience. And call to mind any actions on your part that you realize might have been humanly harmful to others. And as you have those situations in mind, remind yourself that God's nature in them is greater than any hurt they experience as a result of your actions, and that God nature will always prevail. And just allow these words to seep into your consciousness. Any errors, transgressions that bring harm to others 
occur due to the fact that we are still awakening to our divine nature, that we're not fully awake. We will all inevitably make mistakes, and those mistakes may cause temporary harm. But as we remember the power and presence of God in ourselves and others, that power, that presence, points the way to mending our wounds and making good of our mistakes. And as we allow that truth to just seep in, Let us join together in knowing the truth for some of the different human conditions that cause suffering in this world. But we first remember that that one love, that one life, that one infinite goodness of God is the one out of which everything is created and is present fully and equally throughout creation in every being everywhere, including each of us gathered for this service. And so, as we know that God is in all beings, in all situations, let us know that where there is any pain, suffering, discomfort around the changes that occur in the world, because things in this dimension, in the worldly plane, are always changing. That the nature of God that underlies all experiences is constant, changeless. That as something disappears from our lives, there's a new way to experience the love, the joy, the abundance, whatever qualities of God that experience represented and that vibration of God is one that allows us to remain interconnected throughout eternity with those who are no longer on this plane and that allows us to stay connected when it is our turn to move into the next dimension of life. Let us absolutely know that where there's any experience of dis-ease or discord, that the vibration of God is one of wholeness, vitality, health, and as we know that truth, that those conditions dissolve, that the perfect channels for the healing of every human dis-ease, every condition of discord are revealed, and well-being, wholeness is established. Let us further know that this presence of the divine is infinitely creative, and it always seeks to give of itself through each of us in unique ways. And for those who may be feeling unfulfilled, we know that there's a perfect right place. There are any number of places that their unique talents and gifts are needed and they are guided to those perfect right places. Where there's any experience of lack or limitation, we know that this one is abundant. It is infinite. And so, as we open to that truth, we find ourselves to be sourced and supplied absolutely bountifully so we are able to take in and generously give back to life. And where there's any situation of feeling disconnected from love, we know that the core nature of the divine is unconditional love and it lies in each and every one of us. And as we know this truth, that those situations of unforgiveness, holding on to pain and resentment are healed. We move into greater states of being able to feel greater love for ourselves and all beings around us unconditionally. And knowing that that vibration of God's love is always for greater good, let us set our own individual intentions for good in silence. And 
And whatever these intentions may be, greater good for ourselves, loved ones, family members, friends, situations in the world, we absolutely know that God is at the center of all these situations. And as we know this truth, good is revealed. God is revealed. And together we declare, I accept these truths for myself and all beings everywhere. And so we bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths to God, knowing that all paths lead us to the same God, the same truth, and so it's with a heart just filled with gratitude for knowing this truth that I release this word knowing it is so, I let it be, and so it is. And together we say, Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Dita. So this is a time in our service for our affirmative giving. Uh, you can give online. You should be seeing a link showing up right now. If you're not seeing that, it's uh, nhcrs.org, our website, and then forward slash give, and that will take you straight to our donation page. You can also text the word give to 818 457 Three four one nine, and we will be here in the church office for about thirty minutes after service. If you'd like to call in your donation via uh, credit or debit card, but however you choose to give, just thank you, thank you for your donations that allow us to keep continuing to be here for you and to keep this flow of love going back and forth. So with that. Let's hold our gifts to our hearts as we say together. From the love of pure spirit within me, I bless this gift. I send it forth to heal and bless and prosper. It is evidence of my faith and belief. It does good work in the world and returns to me multiplied abundantly. Thank you. Blessed always, blessed always For the arms of God surround us Let our joy be so triumphant That we rest in God and say
Hmm. So as we bring our service to a close, want to say thank you to everyone who's of service to us this evening. Uh, let's start out there in cyberspace. Thank you to practitioners Christine Crawford and Gail Pallott for uh, holding vigil for us, keeping the high consciousness for us throughout the service. To our uh, Zoom folks for the evening, Barbara Berg, Ray Regan, and Mark Kroll, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, to Liz Racy on Facebook Live, thank you to all of you. Uh, without you, we wouldn't be having this experience right now. So definitely, we appreciate everything you're doing for us. To our wonderful people here in the sanctuary, Adam, once again, making sure we were seen and heard up here. To Doreen and Blair, who are here, making sure all the tech stuff is working. <laughs> to Nikki on camera over here. And to Sam and Tina, thank you so much. Once again, just perfect, perfect, perfect. <laughs> so uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, First, uh, just a reminder that you can call your donations in for 30 minutes after the service if you'd like to. Uh, the number is 818-762-7566, or you can go to the website nhcrs.org forward slash give, or text the word give to 818-457-3419. Prayer with a Practitioner is available after the service on Zoom, so just, uh, if you're on Facebook Live right now, just uh, go to our website to get onto the Zoom um, patio so that uh, our Zoom folks can hook you up for a private one-on-one -on -one prayer with a practitioner. You can email your prayer request to prayer at nhcrs.org or call into the church office and option four on the menu allows you to leave a voicemail message letting us know what you would like prayer for. And we check those every evening, both the, vo both the voicemail and the email. So uh, we pick those up and send them out to all of our practitioners. So we guarantee you will be well supported in prayer. Uh, so next Wednesday evening, same time, same place, 6.50 p.m. for the meditation and 7 p.m. for the service on either Facebook Live or Zoom. And my topic this week, uh, next week will be Savior Syndrome. That's Savior, S-A-V-I-O-R. When I told Blair that that was a title, he said, is that three words? Like Savior Syndrome? <laughs> no. <laughs> Savior Syndrome. Um, our annual meeting, the annual meeting for members of our church will be held on February 21st at 11 a.m. right after the service on Zoom. Uh, the Zoom link is the same link that we use for the Sunday and Wednesday services, so it'll be on Zoom only, just so you know. It won't be um, on Facebook Live, and you can find it on our website. A notification email uh, was sent to all members to be sure um, so if you didn't see it, uh, check your junk mail, um, you know, or check your inbox for it. And, uh, you know, if you still didn't get it, please call the church office and we'll give you the information. We look forward to seeing you there. Reminder, there's a Zoom, Zoom virtual patio uh, is going on 20 minutes before services, both Sunday and Wednesday, and you can stay on afterwards to visit with your fellow congregants, and you know, I'll be getting on there in a little bit. Our men's group meets every Sunday from 11 to 11.30 a.m. on Zoom. All men are welcome. And our Zoom meditation continues every Monday through Saturday from 8 to 8.15 a.m. I love connecting with folks for that. And uh, for all of this information, again, just go to our website, nhcrs.org. You can also sign up for our weekly e-blasts and monthly newsletters on the website. So with that, let's just take a moment to turn within once again. And I just give thanks right here, right now for all the 
blessings that we've experienced in our time together, I absolutely know that the divine was flowing through every part of the service that in ways we may not even realize, healings have occurred, our consciousness has been expanded so that we move forward from this point with a heightened sense of that divine nature within us and we get to experience and share it more fully and that ripples out into the world. And so I give thanks for the blessings we've received and how they multiply going forward and in gratitude I release this word knowing it is so, I let it be, and so it is. And together we say, Amen. Thank you again for being with us this evening. Let's stand and sing one more time. Well, you don't have to stand. I'm just used to saying that. Join us in song, however you wish to be. <laughs> A couple of people stood. <laughs> Come on and stand. Why not? <laughs> Blessed always, blessed always, for the arms of God surround us. Let our joy be so triumphant that we rest in God and say, everybody.